He's the director of exposure and aerosol technology at RTI, um, and we're having a conversation about e-cigarettes. And he's one of the national experts, so we're very fortunate to have him within driving distance of Hillsborough. <laughs> well, thank you for the invitation, Kobe. I appreciate it, and it's my pleasure to be here this evening. RTI actually has a very extensive program in electronic cigarettes and vapor products, um, kind of building off our traditional research in tobacco use. So, but in this case, though, we've really built a strong multidisciplinary collaborative looking at uh, usage rates among you know, the public, you know, teenagers, adults, uh, marketing messages, the economics of the industry, as well as the health and safety of the products themselves. So what, so what, why are we so concerned about electronic cigarettes? Why are we worried? A rapidly growing industry that started in uh, 2007, and annual sales now are $6 billion a year. <laughs> If you want a high growth industry, this is, this is it. Um, but it's also a very fragmented industry. There are, it's not just the big, you know, tobacco players like, like the R.J. Reynolds and Altria and such and Lorillard. It's, you know, there's thousands of manufacturers of devices and liquids out there. This is a global problem right now, mainly because there's so much unknown about electronic cigarettes. And so it's got the WHO's attention trying to understand what the harms are and potential benefits. You know, there's a, a lot of discussion about can electronic cigarettes be used as a smoking cessation uh, approach. But, you know, one of the overall conclusions, especially from the WHO, is that the, uh, the, the science needs to be conducted. So, you know, international agencies, uh, uh, federal governments, and even down to the state and local municipalities can make the appropriate regulations. So another reason why, obviously, that there's a lot of concern is that uh, use, use cigarette, youth use electronic cigarettes is rapidly growing. It is now the most prevalent uh, tobacco product that teenagers use these days. So, so what, are the, what are kind of the concerns with uh, electronic cigarettes and, and in respect to public health? Well, it's the um, one big concern is the wide range of uh, constituents and additives in these in these uh, electronic liquids. It's also the fact that during the vaping, the vaporization process, you can, these uh, constituents can be transformed into carcinogens. That's another major concern. Oh, and also during the vaping process, you know, if the user, you know, alters the performance of the device, they can actually uh, overheat the system, for example, and like toxic metals will be leached out from the uh, heating elements inside, this, inside the device. So there's a lot of different things in play and uh, with these devices that can cause uh, health effects and that's why, you know, the public, scientific community, you know, county commissioners, everybody are really saying it's time to reduce and regulation of electronic cigarettes. And obviously, you know, the Federal Food and Drug Administration is looking at, you know, developing a rule to uh, regulate this industry. Act. Now we're going to get into more of my comfort zone here. <laughs> yeah, away from all this kind of policy stuff here. All right. So, what's happening? So, what are you saying? <laughs> I, I can drop my nose now. Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's one last number. One last number. You know, the exact numbers. There are 450 companies producing devices and selling e-liquids in the United States. And there are right now, as of a few months ago, there were 7,500 different e-liquid flavors for sale. So the, um, <laughs> so the, you know, as I said, these these devices uh, were first developed in 2007. The engineering in behind these devices has rapidly evolved in, in those eight years. You know, we've gone through simple devices that started looking like these these cigalikes, which kind of look like you know, imitation cigarettes, to the, now these really fancy systems with rechargeable batteries and Bluetooth connectivity and an app that you can put on your smartphone that tells you, you know, how much you've smoked and when you need to recharge your battery and fill, refill your tank and all, the kinds of, all kinds of stuff. I mean, so, but along with all those technological advances in these devices, you know, they've actually actually become safer. You know, that is one fact. You know, these were cheap, disposable, easily tampered with, easily get these over, to overheat. And they were poor quality control during the manufacturing process. You know, these are high quality devices. You know, I mean, these cost, you know, 50 cents a dollar in the convenience store 
you know, these you have to go to actually, a, you know, one of those vaping shops, tobacco shops, and spend twenty to fifty dollars for the device itself, <coughs> and then, and then plus, you know, extra for the different buttons. But yeah, so I mean, we, you know, these think lights, those were the first generation systems. You know, they're re really kind of falling out of favor. Uh, Kobe brought one of these in, passed around. This is like this is a disposable. They still make these quite frequently, but again, the, the quality has improved. You know, immensely <laughs> over the last, you know, as they've progressed you know, over the generations, and then we got the pins and the tanks. And this one is a is a, a pin type, but also has the Bluetooth connectivity and USB charger and, and all that kind of stuff. Just gotta pass that around. All right. So the so you know we talked a little bit about the device. What about the liquids? They are available with and without nic nicotine, um, even though um, obviously the ones with nicotine are the most popular uh, flavors, but there are people that actually just, you know, use electron cigarettes for the flavors. You know, they like how they like how it tastes like, you know, chewing gum. The flavorings issue is is interesting in that if you look at the research RTI has done before, you know, new users tend to stick with like tr traditional cigarette flavors, you know, the natural tobacco or, or menthol, and then they kind of slowly move into the um, the fruit flavors, and, they, and once they get really get used to the, the vaping process, they really start experimenting more with different fruit combinations. Uh, but they always do, do also go back to using tobacco on a regular, the tobacco flavor on a regular basis. And can you vape marijuana? Uh, <laughs> is that what I'm taking? Yes. Yeah, picture? so that, that is true. So there's, um, there is a underground industry with these devices where they are manu they are modifying them to be able to bake marijuana and other illicit drugs. Mm -hmm. Anything that can be smoked, they're trying to put it in a liquid so you can smoke it. Mm -hmm. Now, the a lot of these flavors of tobacco and all that, you know, they're it's just like a, a can of soda. It's they're trace constituents. You know, like a soda is mainly water, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, a, and some sugar, or you know, if you like sugar sodas, you know. Almost all the liquid in a in an e cig is what's called a is either a propylene glycol or glycerin or a mixture of the two, and those are you know actually common um, food safe additives that you can find in just about anything you buy on the grocery store itself that's liquid based. But here they're putting in these liquids for for vaporization to be the carrier. So essentially, you know, how do these work? You know, you look at this thing, this big long device, and well, you know, like most devices, a big part of it is taken up by the battery to charge to, to operate the power of the system. You know, there's, you know, you got the, the switch activated. There's always a microprocessor to to control the system, and th this is where a lot of the advancements happened in the last few years. Is this microprocessor because it really does a great job controlling the heating element. They really got that programming. Uh, has become more sophisticated, and it, this is also where you get the Bluetooth functionality and and you can program it to you know, you know do custom programming and such. The tank, you know, these real refillable tanks, or where you insert the cartridges, are, are right down here. What happens is, is you you push the button, it heats up, it, it you know it doesn't burn the liquid; it just sort of vaporizes. It's like boiling water. The liquid. Or you know the, the e-liquid, and then you, you inhale it and you suck on the mouthpiece. So what emissions do they produce? You know that's always a big question. This is I love this photograph. <laughs> you know that. You know people see that and they get scared. You know and that to press a photograph. That's the propylene glycol glycerin cloud you're seeing there. Um, and you know that's that's probably extending you know three four feet away from his mouth, and it, and it will can, you know uh, disperse rather quickly. Quickly, some brief terminology. Uh, electronic cigarettes generate a mixture of vapors, so gases, as well as aerosols. So these are the particles um, in the air. So it's like they talk about vaping. You know, it's, it's really just a mix. It is a mixture of gases and particles. You know, the the aerosol, these particles, is what my specialty is, is measured in the size of micrometers. Kind of give provide some perspective. A human hair is 50 to 100 micrometers thick. You know, so we can see that. These uh, and you can, obviously from that cloud, you know, you can see that too. 
but when they, as they disperse, they're not, they don't evaporate to nothing. They're still little particles in the air. They just disperse far enough and they start shrinking. They get to a size that you can't see them anymore. So they're, they're definitely, they're actually they're way smaller than 50 micrometers, as I'll show you in a minute. And I apologize, I will use aerosol and particles anonymous. It's just part of my scientific terminology. I don't mean to confuse you. So what is in these e-cigarette emissions? So here's some of the research we have um, that we've conducted and published. Obviously, you know, so we got here what the chemical is, kind of what its purpose is, is in the e-liquid, and we got the where it's found. So we got the bulk liquid, the aerosol, which is a particle, the aerosol particle, as well as the gas phase. Our research, we found nicotine, which is the active ingredient, in all three phases. You know, so it's, yeah, it's in the liquid. Most people would think tobacco research, most of the nicotine's in the gas phase, but because we have this glycerin propylene glycol carrier liquid, the, the nicotine loves to stay dissolved in those liquid droplets, and that's where, so that's how you find it in that, in that aerosol phase. So then we talked about the glycerin glycol, we got that. And this is where it starts getting interesting. So we found a lot of different artificial flavors, and I got, I got a few of these listed down here, we have um, this Cresol one, this nice long chemistry chemical name. That's a fruit flavor. That's like a fruit punch. These two are kind of associated with, uh, well, actually, ethylmaltol, that's more of like a caramel flavor that's you know, typically found in tobacco, conventional tobacco smoke. And then the methyl naphthalene, that's uh, like a, a smoky flavor, like charcoal, grilling, smoky meat. Mm. Uh, preservatives, you know, these phenolic compounds, you know, again, present in all three phases of the of the e-liquid. And these are your typical food preservatives, you know, BHA and PHT. You know, you look, you know, at your food packages that they could be listed on there, on there, especially on your heavily processed foods. You know, that's because, they're, and they're in there because all these artificial flavors, they can degrade over time. You know, these need to be shelf-stable products, so they have, they have to put in these preservatives. And, um, and obviously then there's artificial colors. Uh, I, I think they're present just enough to give the e-liquid the color. You know, the, the liquid we were testing here was happened to be blue. <laughs> and uh, we could not find that the artificial blue coloring in the aerosol to gas phase. So it's in the liquid. Is it definitely not in the aerosol gas phase? Can't say. But um, just we just couldn't detect it. So we talked about the sizes. So, you know, all these particles are really small. They're, you know, this is, this is a nanometer, so 1,000 nanometers is one micrometer. So these are very small particles, and the, and the trick is, is, you know, this is a graph of the size distribution. You can see that these are two different liquids. We have fruit punch and tobacco. The sizes are different, are much different. And that has impacts on the chemical composition of those particles and where they deposit in your lungs. Because that's what you got here. The size is front to where the particle in your lungs. And the concentration that you're inhaling determines how many particles deposit in our lungs. And so why do we want to know about size and concentration? Well, the, um, I, was, I was alluding to the chemical co composition does, of the particles does vary with the particle size as well as the type of liquid being used. Um, but probably more but the two most important factors are that the size and concentration determine the toxicity of the particles. In general terms, the smaller the particles, let be a smaller, a, the more toxic it is. So you have two particles of the exact same competition, the composition, the smallest one will be the more toxic of the two. <laughs> and um, on your previous slide, that was measuring output of the smoke, the, the vapor, or the second hand? Uh, Before it goes in the lungs or after? So this is what um, the user is inhaling. Okay. And do you have a similar graph for second hand? What is being exhaled will be a very, of the similar size distribution um, and concentration. Well, I'll get to the concentration in a minute. But um, so size distribution is really similar. We don't have good data yet on you know, what would be Secondhand exposure on the other side, or what the size distribution and concentration is, as opposed to conventional tobacco cigarettes. You know, all secondhand exposure is what is exhaled. There's nothing. If, if, if you don't, if you're not, there is no that sort of side combustion happening in, in 
smoke being generated when you're not actually actively in inhaling. So it's, it's all what's exhaled by the user. Mm -hmm. We did some you know modeling of respiratory de deposition and kind of a in general, you know, about 50% of what a user inhales is exhaled. And so that's, you know, possible you know, for secondhand exposure. Um, but interestingly enough, that number is actually quite similar to um, uh, conventional tobacco products as well. So then, so that raises the question, well, if 50% are exhaled, then what is the potential? And so we did, you know, We've done a little research on that, and we were hoping to do more and trying to get funding to do, do more of this research. Um, you know, this is a work in one of our kind of our large exposure chambers, one you know, a little bit smaller than this room, where we had a, someone vaping in one corner, and that, that was the source. And you know, when the user exhaled, you know, we were had a some some sensors about you know three feet away and six feet away. And we can see that we were, you know, here's the traces of concentration as a bunch of time. But you can see really that two meters away, we were getting detectable levels of e-cig vapors. You know, they were 25 times lower than what the user was exhaling, but they were detectable levels. So we know the users obviously inhale them, and they know there's a potential for secondhand exposure. So what are the health implications? You know, that's that's the big question. And that's where actually. NIH and FDA has put a lot of their funding. And it's really kind of focusing on the health health effects side first. Well, obviously, from conventional tobacco, we know the health and effects and toxicity of nicotine are very well known. No really need to you know get into that too much. It's some of the ingredients and byproducts of the vaping process in e-cigarettes are also known. And some of these ingredients can be um, the artificial flavorings. You know, we got the diacetyl, which is the but artificial butter flavor you get in your microwave popcorn, or the artificial, you know, cinnamaldehyde, artificial cinnamon flavor. You know, those are known inhalation toxicants that can cause severe respiratory disease, and you know, in the facilities that manufacture these these artificial ingredients. Um, so there's a, a strong scientific basis for, you know, under that there is a health effect from breathing these in especially at high concentrations. So it could be a very serious effect on the user. Is, what's the ex potential secondhand exposure and health effect unknown at this time? Well, there's also this whole other category of ingredients that are FDA considers generally regarded as safe. You know, grass for short, for ingestion. You know, that's all the preservatives and artificial flavors and food colorings. They're grass for ingestion. You know, these are in your food, what we eat. You know, no one's ever studied what happens when you inhale them, you know, especially at high concentrations from a, from a user perspective. And then there's also the toxicity of the byproducts from the e-cigarette use. The, you know, you know, as I said, the, the quality of the device is improving. You can't tamper with them as well as much as you used to. But, you know, <laughs> you make something harder for someone to tamper with, they work that harder to figure out how to tamper with it. And there's a whole, you know, you, Monitor, you can monitor social media, Twitter and Facebook and all that. There's this whole community that talks about how to modify your e-cigs. So you can, you know, make it hotter, you know. So, you, but that also could, you know, leach metals out of the heating element. You know, or how do you get liquid marijuana into your <laughs> marijuana extract into your into your device, you know, or other, you know, you know things. I also have formaldehyde up there, and you know, if you remember in the last six or nine months, there was a couple NBR stories and big deal about e-cigs produce a lot of formaldehyde, a known carcinogen. And, and uh, there was a lot of backlash from the industry when that scientific paper was published because, you know, they, they were very quick to point out that that researcher, you know, was using a custom e-cig device that he modified so he could get the heating element really, really hot. <laughs> so when you get, you know, when you when heat, Glycerin and, and propylene glycol, the really high temperatures, yes, you will create a lot of formaldehyde. <laughs> but, you know, they, they were quick to point out, like, our devices do not cr cr um, create that much heat. So. Why would someone raise the temperature? Huh? Um, they do it to try to, um, one, they like the, 
the heat, you know, but it's more similar to back tobacco smoke because it's the more of that burning sensation, that feeling in your mouth. But also, they um, there's the community thinks that if you heat up nicotine, you'll you know it'll get more into the gas phase and it'll get into your bloodstream faster and you know you get a fast faster nicotine hit. It's one of the complaints between conventional tobacco users and e-cig users is like e-cig. If you make that switch, they always say the the rush from the nicotine from using the e-cig is always a little slower than using conventional tobacco. <laughs> so what are the associated health risks? Um, well, we know for the from the users, you know, for inhalation toxicology, you know, the nicotine, and some ingredients, and some byproducts are, are well known in the scientific literature. Uh, but the acute and chronic health outcomes, you know, from long-term use of you know of e-liquids that you know contain all these you know, uh, grass uh, ingredients is unknown at this time. You know, they're just uh, Mainly because the research field is so young, we haven't had time to do these five-year, ten-year studies to answer these types of questions. Secondhand exposure has hardly been studied yet. Um, you know, RTI, some folks at um, University of Maryland, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, and University of California, San Francisco. I mean, we're the only four groups that have published any research on secondhand exposure. And that's a grand total of four scientific papers. <laughs> uh, another aspect that hasn't been um, studied at all yet is the idea of tertiary exposure. So that's if you're in a, a public space, a room like this, and you know, uh, nicotine is a semi-volatile. So you exhale it, it'll stay in a droplet phase, and it can like, deposit on a, the back of the chair. <laughs> and then. So there's nicotine on this chair now, and then you, you know you or somebody else, anybody can touch it, and then you get on your skin, and nicotine, for some reason, really um, absorbs quickly through your skin. You know, there's again another kind of horror story. There's both the stories of uh, children getting into the e-liquid bottles, and they were getting it all in their skin, and then they were going into nicotine um, shock, or I can't remember what they call that, but that disease, but you know having to be rushed to the hospital for nicotine poisoning. <laughs> That was a big deal about a year, year and a half ago. <laughs> so in summary, you know, where are we? Where are we in, in the state of the science? Well, it's, it's safe to say the science has not kept pace with the growth of the industry. You know, so I mean, the, the science, unfortunately, is not really able to inform you know, all of you in this room, you know, uh, the Food and Drug Administration has been funding research on e cigs for four or five years, putting a lot of money into it, and they still don't know if they want to regulate e cigs, and if they do, how are they going to do it? <laughs> um, hopefully, they're going to come up with their their plan, you know, publish their uh, plan in the next few months. I think they're getting close. Mm -hmm. uh, areas of most knowledge comes with e cigs is you know. Usage rates, that's been well studied. You know, FDA has done a lot of work in that area, especially in youth populations. And the um, toxicity of the e-cigarette emissions, you know, kind of generically with the well-known constituents. Uh, unfortunately, um, areas of least knowledge are secondhand and tertiary exposure, um, as well as the acute and chronic health effects, of, especially of these um, grass ingredients on the user end. And, and, uh, those who are exposed secondhand. So where does the question of which is safer fall? I'm going to answer it and I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm, I'm going to stick straight to the, the science. Um, it's, are e-cigarettes safer than to conventional tobacco cigarettes? They are safer in that they do not create the massive quantities of carcinogens because there is no combustion process. Right. You know, so yeah, that's that's no. Um, but he sings, especially with all these exotic flavors and preservatives. You know, what are you breathing, and what what's that impact? Of you? We don't know yet. You know, one thing that really concerns me is for some of the flavorings, like the diacetyl. That's a, a class of compounds, the butter flavorings that we study at the NTP and IEHS. 
and um, there are chemicals like butane dione and pentane dione. And in the workers that actually have to handle that chemical, they get something called bronchiolitis obliterans, and people have died from that. So this is a, a really nasty chemical, and I just can't imagine that if someone actually, of course that's at high concentrations, but if somebody would know the potential for the damage that they're doing to their lungs with this chemical, I can't imagine that they would want to inhale it. It, it just, and there are other um, chemicals as well. But the diacetyl, I mean, that's such a red flag, and I'm just so surprised the FDA, you know, OSHA wouldn't let people in the workplace be exposed to it anymore. You have to wear respirators, right. but understanding that's a higher concentration. But still, you're putting it directly into your lungs when you're vaping. But then there are all these um, the other chemicals. And, you know, just the three that you mentioned there, I pulled off the MSDS sheets, just like the ethyl maltol. Oh, ethyl maltol, yeah. Yeah, and so the carcinogenic effects, mutagenic effects, teratogenic, developmental toxicity, not available. They don't know yet. Inhalation, you know, if, if somebody inhales it, allow the victim to rest in a well-ventilated area, seek immediate <laughs> help, you know. I mean, yeah. that's what all of them say. Um, hazardous in case of skin contact, of ingestion, of inhalation, acute oral toxicity. And um, the other one, too, methyl naphthalene, may cause respiratory um, irritation. Um, again, no information on the mutagenic reproductive effects and all that. And then the third one, you had the ditrobutyl 4 methylphenol um, inhalation material is irritating to mucous membranes and upper respiratory tract. May be harmful if inhaled. <laughs> but yeah, we're putting them in. You know, we're allowing the FDA is allowing this. I mean, it's amazing, and it, and we don't know, you know, what's in and uh, what's exhaled and what the exposure can be. And then, of course, the children. There's children, there's babies that could be more affected by this than adults, and that's also a real concern. So I'm really glad that we're looking at this again. I know that when we consider the cigarette ban, I know staff brought the e-cigs to us, and kudos to them for doing that. But at the time, we felt like, wow, we're really trying to slay a beast here, trying to um, ban cigarettes, and we felt like we might poison the well by adding these cigarettes. But, um, I'm, I'm really glad that we are revisiting this. Now we've got some research. That's what we needed. We needed, you know, research on what was uh, actually in the inhaled um, vapors because we didn't know at the time. So uh, it's really great that you guys are doing this research. And thank you so much for coming and That's sharing all of this. Wish with we were us. farther along and provide a. Well, just keep going. <laughs> stronger evidence. Yeah. Thank you right. so much. Thank you.